Achieving sustainable development in the Niger Delta will be the focus of a two-day forum hosted by the Niger Delta Development Commission. The theme of the forum, which will hold in Port Hackett, is re-strategizing development concepts in the Niger Delta region to provide for post-oil wealth. Managing Director of the NDDC, Sir Bassi Danabia, says that state governors of the nine Niger Delta states, representatives from oil firms operating within the region, chairman of local government councils and international observers are expected to attend the forum. The NDDC boss, who paid a curtsy visit to the Shell Petroleum Company of Nigeria Limited, highlights the, su the successes of the commission. In the meantime, the Shell Development Company of Nigeria has reaffirmed its commitment to sustain its contribution to the development of the region. Minimizing waste, managing time effectively and reducing the cost of implementing projects are factors that could ensure the Niger Delta region achieves its full potential. This opinion was shared by the Chief Executive Officer of the Niger Delta Development Commission, Basi Dan Abia, while speaking ahead of a two-day forum which will bring together representatives of various government and non-governmental organizations. The forum is expected to focus on initiatives that will ensure improved partnerships between the Commission, state authorities and intervention agencies. Revive the PhD forum. We've set up a secretariat run by an independent consultant. This is to underscore the importance we place on the issue of partnership. That's why we felt that um, it's not enough sitting down, exchanging mails and phone calls. Let's get to meet on a round table, review the what we've done so far, you know, and then also look at prospect for further collaboration. The NDDC boss, who paid a courtesy visit to the Shell Petroleum Company of Nigeria Limited, highlights the successes of the commission. These include the completion of eight prototype hostels being built in universities and polytechnics across the region. In the meantime, the Shell Development Company of Nigeria has reaffirmed its commitment to sustaining its contributions to the development of the region. Absolutely critical uh, infrastructure to the heart of the Niger Delta. Uh, so to that extent, uh, we are quite pleased this uh, progress we are making and we want to ensure that we join us in the bring it to the right conclusion to the satisfaction of all parties. The PSD meeting begins on Monday and participants are expected to brainstorm on strategies that will sustain and improve successes recorded by the public-private partnership initiatives. Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo is expected to attend the forum. A fresh controversy read its neck last week when the governor of Edo State, Mr. Adams Oshomale, told journalists after a meeting in Abuja with his colleagues, governors, that the states will no longer be able to pay the minimum wage of 18,000 naira. He explained that the dwindling oil revenues and the inability of the state to build their revenue base makes it very clear that it will be difficult to pay workers 18,000 naira per month. The payment of 18,000 naira minimum wage was arrived at during President Olusha Gobasanjo's administration. This statement has not gone down well with members of the Nigerian Labour Congress who have threatened to go on strike and also challenge the governors to attempt living on 18,000 naira per day themselves, not to talk of stretching it for one month. Well, joining me now on the News at 10 is the publisher of Political Economist and former editor of Daily Times of Nigeria, Mr. Ken Obeche. I want to thank you so much indeed for coming on the News at 10 at this time. It's been challenging for workers, surviving on 18,000 naira minimum wage, as we know it today. Do you see anything below this living wage practicable? In the first instance, I don't think it's even a living wage. 18,000 naira per month, that's roughly $80 or 30 days for somebody that has a family. I think it's extreme wickedness for anybody to have conceived a reduction to that kind of money that is even pittance. 
at, the, at this point in time, I thought what the governors will be looking for is how to source money, be more creative, so that they can even enhance the payment, the minimum wage. 18,000 Naira is too small to pay any worker in the 21st century, especially in an economy that is dipping, in an economy that the inflation is runaway inflation. This is not a living wage in the first place. So the governor should not even tinker with it in any way. Mm. They should up it. So what would you recommend? I would recommend that they keep paying it. They have to look for the money. And for crying out loud, I've always said this, that if we have the leakages blocked in any government house, every government, whether it's local government, state government, and federal government, should be able to fulfill its financial obligations to its workers. The point is that these governors are looking for scapegoats when they should look inwards. They should look at their security votes for crying out loud. Why are they quiet and silent on the security votes? They should tell us how much they take individually as security votes and half the security votes. Because that is actually money that we don't, nobody audits it and they just allocate. It is not even uh, money appropriated openly in their, in, their, in their state assemblies. This money at their behest, some of them run over, in, into one, over one billion in, a, in 30 days, in a month, in some, in some states. Some 700 million naira in some states. That is money you should have. That is where you should think of, not 18,000 naira to a, a worker. That 18,000 naira doesn't take them to their homes. It takes them, it, I mean, it, it just gives them sustenance to live, to breathe, and have the capacity and the strength to come to work the next day. It, it's mm. not a living wage in the first place. Now, this is what the state governors are saying. They're complaining of dwindling revenues from oil, which we already know, yes. low internally generated revenue, which is why they say that they are unable to pay uh, the 18,000 naira minimum wage. With, with the country pushing further into economic uncertainties, do you think that the governors just may be justified? Don't you think so? There's no, one inch? there is no justification for this, for them to even take out the minimum wage. I'm saying that, look, there's something they call priority. Most of them don't even prioritize the needs of their states. In the first instance, I am not an apostle of a minimum, uniform minimum wage for every state, for the whole federation. We are running federalism, for crying out loud. Every state should have its own minimum wage. You should be able to consume what you kill. You should be able to spend what you earn, not what somebody has earned somewhere. The minimum wage, a uniform, a uniform minimum wage for Nigeria is actually the, 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 the core of the problem. In a true fiscal federalism, every state should grow at its own pace, have your own minimum wage that you can afford to pay, and then grow from there. And that will also make the state to look at their own internal capacities. What can we do to generate wealth in our own state? That is the only way Nigeria can grow. This idea of sharing money, everybody runs to Abuja every 30 days and they share money, has made everybody lazy, mentally indolent, our leaders, and that's why we are in this quandary. Because at a point in time, oil was one, over $100 uh, dollar per barrel. What did we do with that windfall? They were not creative enough to divest, to invest this money, these same state governors and their predecessors. Now, there is, there is a recession, more or less recession, and the person you think should pay the price is the poor worker. I don't think you're, you're, that's an unkind court on the worker. I think the person that should lead that austerity measure is the governor himself, the governor of every state. Tell the people, okay, our recurrence has to go down, and I will lead that charge. This is what I take as security vote every month. I'm going to take one quarter of it this time and concede the remaining three quarters to the states. You know what the government is doing is trying to diversify the, the economy of the country. Do you feel if this is done at the state levels, this will provide a succor for the state governors to be able to maintain at least 18,000 naira minimum wage? Definitely, but you know, the, this is just a low hanging fruit to cut costs, the governor's cutting costs. 
when you as you cut course, you begin to envision a, the life of that state in the next five years, ten years. That's when you begin to diversify. And in diversification, people are mounting agriculture. Yes, I am for agriculture, but I still feel that in this country where we have a youth board of very intelligent, cerebral, creative, innovative youth, this country should go the way of ICT. It should take the path of Japan, the path of India, where young people are becoming billionaires and creating real wealth, wealth that people can see by just their mental power. And this country has the kind of youth that have this mental power. We talk about Yahoo Yahoo. I always use it as an instance. Yahoo Yahoo, forget the negative side of it. It tells you that the person doing Yahoo Yahoo is a very smart kid. It's a very intelligent person. Anybody that can breach your network is thinking ahead of you. We can harness this ICT, software development. If you go to these states, all of them have built software parks. Every year, they vote to create software parks. But it's only on paper. These things are not there. That is the corruption I'm talking about. But they know that they can leverage on technology and the capacity of the Nigerian mind. The, the, the capacity of Nigerian mind has not been tapped, mm. especially in Nigerian youth. The state governors should begin to think creatively and innovatively so that they can create wealth within the pockets of their states. And I think going forward, this country should begin to look at going back to true fiscal federalism, where every state as a federating unit should have its own minimum wage, its own laws. Uh, why we are having this problem is that we have thrown everything in one basket and we share from that basket. And has made many state governors so, so, the fact they grow fat in government house. There is no burden of office. You don't see it on some of the governors. They just go to government house and they are looking younger. You shouldn't look younger. I'm there afraid. is what they call burden of office. I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it. Uh, Mr. Ken Ogbeche, uh, publisher of Political Economist, we want to thank you so much indeed for your time thank you and your much. thoughts on the subject. Thank you. More than 3,000 delegates have converged on Johannesburg in South Africa for this year's edition of the uh, Afri 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 AfriCity Summit. The summit brings together mayors and local government officials from across the world to discuss common issues affecting governance and development with a view to benefiting from peer experiences. Our correspondent, Betty Dibia, was at the opening ceremony in Johannesburg, South Africa, today, and now reports. And opening with a very colorful bang is the Afri City Summit, the seventh edition, holding in Johannesburg, South Africa. And the theme for the 2015 edition is Shaping the future of Africa with the people, Africa's local government contribution to the Africa 2063 vision. More than 3,000 delegates from across the world, and the focus is local governance and making it relevant for the people's development. Local government is the indispensable vehicle through which our social, political, and development agenda is driven. In this regard, it is important to note that the year 2015 has been an important global year for local government. To achieve the Africa we want in 2063, several issues require new, require innovative thinking, reward, reward, requires new approaches. And the role of local government is critical in enabling cities and towns to be the engines of growth contributing substantially to national growth. Speaker after speaker reflected on the developmental challenges facing Africa, which must be tackled with good governance, especially at the local level. Leadership, not easy to define, but easy to see. Mayors that succeed have this leadership capacity. There is no successful mayor without accountability to their stakeholders and especially to their citizens. There are far-reaching expectations on many fronts, including youth development issues as well as collaborative efforts to fight terrorism. What we want to, to do here is to try and make local government understand that the primary role of uh, 
their function is to rebuild hope on this continent. Well, this is what is being uh, discussed here. How to ensure that the cities come together, the mayors come together to ensure that um, as our cities grow, this development is harnessed very well so that our vision of an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa can be achieved. The next four days will see an array of thematic and open sessions looking at perspectives through which local governments would align and be relevant to the developmental agenda endorsed by African leaders, the Vision 2063. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. Michael Soy is a Nairobi-based artist whose pieces provide a personal reflection and satirical commentary on contemporary social, economic and political trends in Kenya. He works, his works revolves around corruption, which Michael sees as a big problem in Kenya. This, he says, has greatly hampered the development of his beloved country. Art Review tonight looks at an African activist who employs art to try and change a negative way of life. In his world, the Nairobi-based artist plays the role of conscience. Michael Soy picks on the ills in the society and plays it up in the only way he knows how, with his paint and brush. That's his way of bringing change to the system, which is his biggest inspiration. You go to town in Nairobi, sit down on a bench for half an hour, you have enough inspiration to work for three months. One that has gotten him more foes than friends. I do a lot of work that revolves around uh, social commentary. I mean, I create work that revolves around a lot of uh, the things that basically affect the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary Kenyans. He makes no bones about the issues which are always in his head, screaming to breathe life through these images, which are similar. They can almost pass for sisters. The irony here is just to show how we all need each other in the world and that no one is an island. I create a lot of work that uh, addresses very controversial subjects, you know, commercial sex work, interracial relationships, intergenerational relationships, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, basically what I'm trying to do is I'm documenting Nairobi right now, and uh, some of these, I'm documenting the city, and I'm documenting some of the things that a lot of people find very uncomfortable to discuss openly. The colors don't help either. Far from subdued, but loud and proud, Michael Soy insists, no pun intended, the idea is to right the wrongs, then create a visual diary so in the next 15 to 20 years, young people will look at his work and see how far the Kenyan society has come. Uh, the issue of commercial sex work is big business in this city and I mean people will always try to bury their heads in the sand and pretend that some of these things do not happen. Uh, everybody is a Christian in this country. We go to church, we sing very loudly, but nobody tells you what they do on Thursday, Friday and Saturday night. You know? So what I do is that I document those three days. And a lot of it is very nasty stuff. <laughs> Extremely nasty. His art has received more accolades abroad, but not for the social commentary. It went from being just a pretty painting on the wall to a fashion accessory. This is merchandising for me, you know. This is not what I do. I'm not a merchandiser. I'm just trying out something. I make the bags, which is like a... It's more like transferring this image onto something functional. And, you know, it has become very popular. And... Uh, uh, this particular image has put me in a lot of trouble. And the icing on the cake is the owner, Academy Award-winning actress Lupita Yungo, who shot into limelight after her spectacular performance in the movie 12 Years a Slave. Now everyone wants a piece of this item. She bought a bag and posted it on social media now. Everybody in the world wants a bag. <laughs> I, went from, uh, I went from doing uh, 10 bags in a month to 10 bags in a day. You know, and uh, to be very honest, I cannot meet the demand. You know, and uh, when I started doing the bags, I mean, for me it was, uh, I was actually doing them out of fun. You know, and then it got to a point where, you know, people started walking into the studio and, uh, okay, fine, I'll buy one. And then, you know, before you know it, and then when this image went up, you know, now half the world wants a mark. <laughs> this new rush doesn't tickle his fancy. I would rather be doing my art than be making the bags. Michael Soy is a chip of the old block. His father was also an artist. 
so he started painting as a child, but officially began his career in 1996. Still ahead on the news at 10, and Mori led Great Britain to their first David Cup title in 79 years. That's on Sports News. Stay with us.